just worrying about backup singing and you know you're 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 traveling the world with all these names, right? Eric Clapton, Joe Cocker, Leon Russell. The, the list just goes on and on and on. Wildest ride of your life? Was it a wild time? Was it just a really exciting time? You know what? I think I, background, because I contracted background sessions and because right. I was in that position to, to be responsible for how the day was going to go and sometimes I would start at 8 in the morning and finish at midnight and go from session to session but being able to pull together the right singers for the particular artist and also knowing that these... I read music because I studied piano from the time I was like five years old. Right. So we read music, and that was vital with a lot of contract contracting background sessions. Some of them weren't, so I could bring in singers who didn't read music but had an incredible feel for creating background parts on the spot. So depending on what the session was, that's who I would hire for that day. Mm. So having to be so focused all day long and really on top of my game, there was no partying during the week when I was working. There was, it, was, it was serious business. No kidding. <laughs> this, we had fun, yeah. but, it, but it, was, it was clarity. Yeah. This is, I guess, what set you up for the Joe Cocker tour where you worked with a giant a seemingly giant choir of people. You were managing, you, were, you put together, what, 55 people or something like well, that? Well, the, the choir was, and that was the whole tour, were 55 whole tour. people. Leon uh, put together the band, Leon Russell, right. was asked to put together this band because Joe had been contracted to this 22-city tour. And he'd come in from England, come off of a, of a tour. The Grease Band was behind him, and... He came in expecting to be able to say, you know, I'm not feeling so good. I think that I'm, I don't feel like doing this tour. And his manager said, it doesn't work that way. Not if, so you, much. if you don't do this <laughs> tour, which starts in five days, you'll never work in the United States again. Huh. So exhausted, Joe called on Leon Russell to put together a band for him. And Leon said, I'll only do it if I have control of the band. And that's how that's how he became the captain of space and time. <laughs> <laughs> and Leon started calling people, and and he reached out to me, and I started calling people. He had already called, you know. I said he said I've called this person, this person, the, the Matthews brothers, and some people that ended up in the choir actually came to rehearsal um, because we had kind of an open rehearsal, and we rehearsed like 12 hours, 12 to 14 hours a day for four days. Hmm. And during those rehearsals, people would kind of wander in. And Claudia Lanier was one of those people who just went, somebody said, come on down, we're going to this great rehearsal that's going on with Joe Cocker, and you need to see what's going on. I think it was Graham Parsons. And she came down, and um, Leon, you know, went, said, you know, I've, I hear you can sing. Do you want to sing something for me? And so she sang for Leon, and he said, you're hired. Hmm. <laughs> and she had a solo on the tour. So I called some people, but some people kind of came in through the side doors and just ended up there. There were a lot of people standing up where the choir mics were who were not singers. They were girlfriends and wives and <laughs> just best friends who got invited on the tour because... At one point, Joe felt like it was starting to get out of control already during the rehearsals. And he said, do we really need four drummers? And Leon said, well, which three are you going to fire? <laughs> <laughs> so we took everybody. <laughs> and it made a great movie. <laughs> it must have been like herding cats, though. I mean, that's a lot of people to you move know, around. It was, it was insane. Yeah. And I think when... <laughs> When we first started the tour, it w we were so full of, uh, of the music and the excitement of doing something that had never been done before that we just, we just stuck together. We were like, this is, you know, we're a unit. This is fabulous. And that lasted for about maybe two weeks. And then it just went to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> and this group splintered over here. And then there were these people over here and this group over here. And if you read or hear the song, Leon's song, The Ballad of Mad Dogs and Englishmen, it's clearly laid out how rapidly it fell apart. 
But when the music began, every night on stage, when we hit the stage, it was so cohesive, it was incredible. And Joe, no matter what was going on with Joe, whether he was happy or whether he had taken a handful of drugs or whatever, his performances every night were perfection. He never, I never heard the man make a mistake. No. You were the living embodiment of the idea that music brings communities together then, it sounds like. Absolutely. It, well, it did. It doesn't hold it together, but it brings it together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it got hard, though. You tried to leave the tour a couple times? I, I did, because at one point, um, and you all, I've written a book, and you all have to read the book to yeah. get all, all the fine details. And some of them are not so pretty, but, but I was um, physically abused by one of the drummers, who was at that time my boyfriend. And after that, I would go to Joe because I really lost heart. I didn't yeah. want to be around him or be around that energy. And I would sit with Joe on the plane every night. And so many nights, I would say, Joe, I, I've got to go home. I can't do this anymore. And he would say, you can't leave, love. You're the only friend I've got. And I stayed for him. Hmm. And in the end, it paid off because at the end of the tour, A&M came back and asked me if I would signed with them as an artist, so it was worth it, I guess. Not, yeah. the, not the abuse, that's never, the abuse is never, never good. Yeah. But staying was. Joe passed, and you guys had a Mad Dogs and Englishman reunion earlier this year, is that we, right? It was just a little over a week ago. A week ago? Yeah, it was on, it was 9-11 actually, Whoa. at a festival called the Lockin Festival, and it's outside of Lynchburg, Virginia, it's a festival that takes place every year, and for the past several years, this group, Tedeschi Trucks, with Susan Tedeschi and Derek Trucks, uh, have played every year because they became a favorite of the Lock and Festival audience. And when they first got together, they, they're a married couple. They've been married 15 years. And when they first joined their bands about 11 years ago, they actually sat down and watched Mad Dogs and Englishmen, and they modeled their band after the Mad Dogs and Englishmen band. And they actually perform a lot of that music in their show hmm. because to them, that was the best of, of, of uh, music styles, to have more than one drummer. They have two drummers and some percussionists. And not four. A lot of, not four, but there's <laughs> only two of them. Right. And, <laughs> and they're doing it all year round. Right. But their band is was amazing to work with. And several of the alum came back. Of course, Leon Russell, Claudia Lanier, myself, Pamela Polland, um, Bobby Torres, Bobby Jones, the Matthews brothers. Uh, as many of us as could get back for it came back. And it was, uh, we rehearsed for two days. And like the Joe Cocker tour, they filmed us from the time we got there, mm -hmm. filmed the rehearsals, filmed everybody, kind of interviews backstage, and hopefully it's going to be another documentary about the reunion with the Tedeschi Trucks band. A lot of guest artists and stars, and it was amazing. You can see it on YouTube. Just like this BAM Center talk. Just like this is going to be on YouTube. <laughs> Um, so after Joe Cocker, you really start taking off, right? I think one of the great moments in your life is the album you released, I think, in 77. What was that one called? Uh, and it was Anytime, Anywhere. Yeah, that one really, it went platinum. It was a big hit. Did that catch you by surprise, just like the regional hit in Los Angeles caught you by surprise, or were you able to see that one coming a bit more? I, I don't think I saw it coming, and I'd been around... Success, of course, with people that I knew and people that I worked for as a background singer. So I, I kind of knew what it was like, but I, I didn't. I never really imagined it happening to me on that level. I just wanted to have a steady fan base that would support me being able to make an album every year or two. And A and M seemed to be in the game for longevity. When I signed with them, they said we're in for the distance. We're in for the long for the long distance of this. And that really gave me a lot of security as an artist to every time I would go in to record because I had done three or four albums before mm -hmm. we had the, the, the platinum, triple platinum or whatever it ended up going. Um, but when it happened, 
although I kind of knew what it might be like for somebody else when it happened, it was just, it was over the moon for me. Yeah. And I had just, just um, a few months before I had lost a child. And it, you know, that album seemed to come at a time where I needed a lift. Yeah. And um, to be able to be on the road, because Chris and I were married and had one daughter and had lost the second child. And when we went out on the road on the heels of that, it was kind of hard on Chris because we would hit these huge venues and Chris would be p playing and people would be going, Rita, Rita. He'd say, she'll be out of here when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> That was kind of hard for him. Yeah. Uh, you kind of became with him, kind of, I guess, the queen of country a little bit, right? Your albums did really well. You you won two Grammys for Best Country Vocal with along with Chris. I wonder how music uh, reflects the person that you are at that time. It, was country a road you wanted to go down to because it was a genre you wanted to explore? Was it just because that's the musical conversation you and Chris had as a married couple? Was it a business decision? Like, well... Chris was country, yeah, and I think it was easier for me because I grew up in Nashville, for easier for me to go into country music than it was for Chris to like jump over to like pop and jazz, because right. that really was not something that he, I don't think was even uh, uh, a possibility for him. He he was he was an outlaw, and he could I mean not that kind of outlaw. No, <laughs> he couldn't. He couldn't really, you know, jump styles of music. And I think the music that we made, you know, was such a, a sweet compromise because um, we had our band on the, on the albums that we did together and we really recorded the music that we wanted to record. And I continued to make my style of records during all that time. Yeah. We would do an album together and then I would go and do an album of my own with A&M. And we would alternate between Monument Records, which was his label, and A and M, so that everything was fair, but the albums still were they were considered country. Yeah. What does country have? What do you like about country that you can do there that you don't do elsewhere? Is it Well, you know, country music to me it is just so sincere and honest and and it, it comes from a real pure place. I know Chris's music did. Mm. And when I first met Chris, we had tours booked across Canada back to back. I was like one night behind him. And some of my dates got canceled, so I would jump ahead and go to his concerts. And I really sat in the audience and saw what Chris did and saw how he how he moved, I would say how Chris would move people's hearts. And I had been with bands that were kind of, our goal was to get people jumping up and down and stomping their feet and rocking. And when I saw the power of moving people's hearts and what he did, I was so deeply touched and really amazed at his craft and his artistry as a songwriter and not somebody that had tremendous voice or a polished voice, I would say. But really, his music came from his heart. Mm. And it was incredible for me. I just loved him more. You, you played a concert here in Banff last night, and you referred to him as your favorite ex-husband. I do. <laughs> <laughs> he is, uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful human being. And we have been best friends for... Uh, as I feel like for all of my life, because it, I can't remember life without Chris, really. Mm -hmm. we, were, um, we were together for eight years, and um, we have a beautiful daughter and three grandchildren together, and, and we've, I, we're like a blended family. Chris remarried and has five children with his wife, Lisa, and they're all now grown. The last one is in college, but... If the kids are in, if I'm in L.A. Or, or the kids are in L.A. and I'm in San Diego and my daughter is out for the summer, she lives in Asheville, North Carolina, everybody ends up at my house. Hmm. And it's just a big blended family. And we have, 
uh, just a great deal of love and respect for each other. So you're talking about people would shut your name at Chris concert, and when Chris was on stage, you were popular. Did popular po did the popularity of that help you redefine yourself? Did it d redefine you at all? Did you rethink the way you approached music and who you were as an artist, or was it? Uh, I don't. I, you know, I not really. I think that I just felt like there was a lot more pressure. It wasn't s playing smaller venues with my band. You know, we. We could be on the road as much as we wanted to before the big record, but when the big record came, we were in really big venues. I went back to Florida State 10 years after I graduated, and there were 10,000 people at the concert. And, and I, before that, when I was in college, I was singing in a lounge in the hotel down, <laughs> downtown. So, you know, it, it really, to look out and see so many people, and also to realize that that doesn't define me as an artist or a human being. That's just what's going on right now. So enjoy right. it right now while it's happening, because as Quincy Jones had told me years before, there's a there's kind of a, like a cycle in life, and that goes with music too. You're going to be, you're going to swing up, and you're going to be wildly successful, and then that you're going to drop back down again. It doesn't change who you are. You know, you're still the same person. Don't put any value in in uh, the numbers. Just, you know, stay true to yourself. Enjoy the ride. It was a great ride. But it was a great ride when, the, when it swung back down again. Yeah. Because that's when I really started to dig into the artistry of what I was doing. Mm. And I remember being in New York and sitting with Sammy Davis Jr., at uh, an AIDS banquet with with uh, Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis and Dionne Warwick. And I was sitting with Sammy, and he said, well, what are you up to? And I said, well, I'm not recording right now. I, I left my label, and I'm not recording. And he said, girl, you don't need to record. He said, you're a singer. Learn about what you do. You don't need a record. And, I, and for a couple of years, I didn't pursue a record contract. Mm. I just started digging into what I do and and try, trying to communicate with audiences and really have, you know, have an experience instead of just hitting the stage and then trying to get out without seeing anybody. It right. became, to me, more about connecting with people. And I think that's when I really started enjoying my work more. Mm. Just as a sidebar, is there anybody you haven't met? <laughs> um, I haven't met Taylor Swift. <laughs> and I'm a big fan. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, in the 90s, you ended up collaborating with Robbie Robertson, actually. I did. And that was for, I think, a television series? It was a series. Uh, it was on Ted Turner's network, and it was called Music or it was called The Native Americans. And Robbie called me because he knew that I am Native, because only Native people worked on this project. And it really was, I think it was four, uh, two or three hour shows that were on consecutively on television that really gave an accurate history of what happened with Native people in North America with what Robbie affectionately calls the invasion, and many Indian people do. Uh, you know, there were T-shirts that said in 1492, Native people found Columbus lost at sea, which <laughs> <laughs> kind of rang true with us. Uh -huh. uh, so Robbie called and said, I'm doing an album that will be the background music for, the, for this TV special, and then it will be an album. Uh, we're calling this group the Red Road Ensemble, and he'd already gathered some people, and he said... I know you have a family that sings. He said, can you get some of the women in your family together and come down to Village Recorders and, and listen to some of the things I'm doing? So I went down and met with Robbie for two or three nights and heard the things that he already had, had in development and was just amazed. He's always amazed me. Mm -hmm. I've always been such a fan of Robbie's music. And so I called my sister Priscilla and her, knee, uh, her daughter, my niece, Laura Satterfield, and we went down and, and did all the background music um, for Robbie. And that, that went so well that he, 
I'm joking here, but he forced you. He insisted that the three of you form your own group. He did. We <laughs> we we call him our fairy godfather, <laughs> <laughs> because he at the end of those recording sessions, Robbie said, "You all really need to think about forming a group, and writing your stories, and singing your stories, and you know, f make a record. You know, this music needs to be out there." And Priscilla and I looked at each other and. And honestly, just it was like full circle from the promise that we had made to Mama Stewart that we would carry on the family tradition of mm -hmm. singing our family stories and and the stories of our, our our tribe of the Cherokee people. And we recorded some things in Cherokee. We did the first CD that we did. This was, is Walela. It was yes. We named our band Walela, which is Cherokee for a hummingbird, which was my Indian name. My sister called me, an, for all of our lives, the Hummer. <laughs> and I was the Hummer with some other people. Leon wrote a song called Hummingbird. But to get back to it, we went up to Santa Fe because we thought that would be a great place, Santa Fe, New Mexico, to record. And after we got up there, we realized that we were at about 10,000 feet altitude and probably not place best place to <laughs> sing, but <laughs> but it did work out well because it was a great atmosphere for us to to record and to write and to fulfill our dream of doing that first record. And uh, it went when the when the album came out, it just had wings. People would get in touch with us and and contact us and. They would say, tonight I was in my apartment building in so-and-so city in the United States, and I put on my Walela CD, and suddenly it felt like stereo, and I opened the door and realized that four other people in my building had started at the same minute that I did, and it was just echoing throughout the, throughout the canyon. And that's the way the music really took wings, and all over the world. The music was uh, was accepted. I mean, we really became like world artists at, mm. with that first CD, and it was, that to me, that was amazing. Well, I mean, one of the most beautiful songs from Olela is the Cherokee version of "Amazing Grace," which you sung at the concert last night. Um, it's it's you you've, you've called it basically probably not just yourself. It's the Cherokee national anthem. It is the Cherokee national anthem. Because it was the song most sung on the Trail of Tears, which was the forced relocation of the Cherokee people and of the five civilized tribes. And because of the integration of European society and Native society at that time, songs that were sung in white churches were sung in Indian churches. And it was the song most sung on the Trail of Tears. And today in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, which is the seat of the Western Band of Cherokee, and in Cherokee, North Carolina, the seat of the Eastern Band, it's the Cherokee National Anthem still. When I played in Cherokee, North Carolina a few years ago, I had <clears throat> we were in the grandstands at one of their um, outdoor venues, and all the, the grandstands were full of Cherokee people, of course. And when I started singing Amazing Grace in Cherokee, every single person sang it with me because they know it. What's a moment like that for you as a singer? It's uh, otherworldly. It's I feel like I'm really part of part of God, and that we all are. Mm. And part of this, the spirituality of that song, because to me that song is not so much a religious song as it is a spiritual, mm. and it's a spiritual experience for me to sing it. There's a line, of course. I once was lost, but now I'm found. In the English language version, I don't know what it sounds right. like in Cherokee. Have you ever felt lost that way? Um, I'm sure I have. I don't, I, I really don't. Um, I think I take experiences, things that may have felt bad or felt sad, impacted me negatively. I try to just take that experience and move forward with it because I don't, I don't, like to dwell in the past on any level as you know as far as I think if you're unable to move forward if you're constantly looking over your shoulder with the woulda shoulda if I'd only 
Yeah. So I, I don't do that. So I don't have a lot of memories of that. Um, I just try to let those go.